Right. Right. That's that's the fun part about this kind of change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this the first couple days? Like, uh, yeah. 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 I wish they just read it. I know. I think they are as open. Yeah, we're reading that. There's a little bit of change. Good morning. If you can hear us online, go ahead and uh, give us a thumbs up. Give us a comment. Let us know that you can hear us. Good morning. How you guys doing? Guys, I'm gonna do some worship, but let's hang out. Let the kids hang out. They can be in here for worship and have snacks. No coffee, sorry, no coffee for the kids. But <laughs> you guys, well, actually, we had a time change. You guys can have coffee. Yeah. All right. So, but uh, let me pray, and then we'll uh, we'll worship together a little bit. And whenever you guys feel like it's necessary, go. On, okay. So let me pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and for your love, Lord. Father, I just thank you so much for just my, my brothers and sisters here, Lord, just the um, your faithfulness, Lord, just to, to meet us, Lord, as we gather and study your word this morning, Lord. Father, we pray that you would remove anything from our hearts and minds that would distract from your glory, Lord, the things of this week, the things of this year, whatever things we may be um, looking forward at or um, be dreading, Lord, whatever the things are, Lord, I pray that we would just lay them at your feet, that we would worship you, Lord, just trusting that, Lord Jesus, you are the God of just great things, of the unsearchable, marvelous, numerous things that without number, Lord, we don't know the things that you have planned for us, but we know that you're good, Lord. And so we just trust in you and we worship you for your goodness this morning, Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you for your cross, for your resurrection, uh, that you've taken our sin, Lord, that you have uh, cast it as far as east is from the west, Lord, as we've put our faith in you. And so now we worship you this morning, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We love you and praise you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's worship. Oh, yeah. 
that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. Father, that you you were, you are, and you always be. Lord Jesus, we think throughout Scripture when, when you proclaim that you are the great I am. Jesus, you identify that you are God. And Lord, we know it as we live through the power of your Spirit, Lord. We know that the promises that you've laid out in your truth and your word, Lord. Father, as we walk in them, we see that they are absolutely true and sincere and verified, Lord. And you're so great. You're so awesome, Lord. Father, we're so thankful for all that you've done for us. Father, we give you our praise, Lord. It's the, the least that we can do is to respond to the graciousness of our Lord. And Father, we just continue to worship you now, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. Life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Thank you. 
earth. All of the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. because of the good news. Lord Jesus, that you have come, that you, you live the perfect life, just fulfilling all righteousness, Lord, so that you could willingly go to the cross, Lord, for the joy that was set before you. You despised the shame. You sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And because of your atoning work upon the cross, Lord Jesus, we now can gather together filled with your spirit, Lord, to worship you, to proclaim your truth, Lord and Father. We thank you so much for this place that you've given us, Lord. As, as, as odd or different as it may seem in this culture to be gathering together, especially right now, to be gathering together in someone's home and just be hanging out and worshiping. Lord, we know it's because it's what you've called us to do, to fellowship together, not to forsake that fellowship, Lord. And Father, when there's two or three gathered, Lord, we know that you're going to speak, you're going to move mightily this morning, Lord, through the power of your word. Lord, so I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive, Lord. Father, I pray that you would just speak mightily, Lord, that you would bless your word. Lord, we lift up the word right now, Lord, that you would just anoint it and bless it as we go through it today, Lord. I pray that you would just allow it to, to convict us, to exhort us, to encourage us, Lord, to make us more like you, Lord Jesus, through the power of your spirit. Father, we just thank you for all that you've done, Lord, and all that you'll continue to do, Lord. We love you and praise you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. I'm like, this is awesome. There's people here. That's good news, right? That's a good sign. Hey, I'm going to switch seats if you guys want to grab coffee and yes, sir. grab some snack. You guys will to the table and the chairs, wherever you feel comfortable. Um, we'll change spots real quick. Thanks, dude. How are we doing online? Can you guys hear us okay? Can you see everything all right? All right, looking like you guys are good. We're going to start in about one minute. We're going to grab something to drink and then we'll start here. Okay, 
All right, so we are going to be in Luke chapter four this morning. And um, for those of you that have not been here, I think everyone's been here so far. This is good. So um, I actually, I teach out of the New King James Version. So if you wanted to copy that, I have some translations over there on that stand right there. Or you can pull it up on your phone. Um, Because I know it's always weird, like when you get out a different translation, you're trying to follow what's being taught. So that's what I tend to teach from. It's what I like. doesn't make it the best translation, but for me, it's the one I enjoy teaching from. So um, this morning, we are going to be in Luke chapter 4. And the last few weeks we've been studying through, we've seen that Luke is writing an account to show a man named Theophilus. Okay. And we know that there was a true man named Theophilus. He, that's a very like Greek Roman name, right? And Luke himself was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. He was a physician. He was highly educated and he's putting this account together. We know he's running. It's like a running narrative that he went and interviewed all the people involved with the scene that is Jesus Christ's life. And so it's almost like, you know, it's been compared to like, if you were to see a a, a car accident and someone was come over and say, Hey, what did you see? And you're standing on this side of the street, you can give your report, but the person on the other side of the street, they saw it differently, same event, but they're going to give their account. Right. And so what a good investigator does, he takes all those accounts and puts them together and says, this is the story. That's what Luke's trying to do here is to show us that, Hey, Jesus is the perfect man. He came to save, not just the Jews, but Gentiles as well. And see, I don't know about you guys. That's crucial for me because I'm not a Jew. <laughs> I'm really glad that Jesus came to save Gentiles. And we were joking. I think Jen pointed this out last week. She's like, we're pretty much not only are we Gentiles. I think almost everyone in this place last time was Italian. Like we got the DeFazios, the Giottis, the Marinis. It's like a mob gathering, man. This is wild. So yeah, sorry if there's not Italian. So well, you're, you're in. You're, this, is, this is like, this is like, forget about it. yeah, this is forget about it. That's right. And this is like Olive Garden when you're here, your family, right? No, I'm just, no, um, it's funny. And also as Italians don't eat it all. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, but uh, it's funny. You have Luke here just saying, look it, this is for everyone. And I think how cool it is that in the year 2021 in a house in McKinney, Texas, we're opening up the word of God. And this story about a Jewish man, Jesus has absolutely transformed and changed the way we live because of the hope that he gives us through the power of his spirit, through the power of his resurrection, we've been promised eternal life through his atoning sacrifice, not by our works, but by his work. Amen. Amen. And so when we're looking at that, what we're going to see in Luke four, it's an exciting chapter because last week we saw Jesus got baptized and it was really the start of the public ministry. And for me, it's always fun to teach through the Bible, no matter where you're at, but how much more fun when you start to get into the actual ministry of Jesus. And so we're going to see that today in Luke chapter four. So we're going to see the testing, the teaching and testifying of Jesus Christ. And so if you're at Luke chapter four, say I'm there. there. All right. Awesome. I'm going to jump into the first two verses just so we can get some context. It says, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. So we're going to pause it right there because that's our context for what we're looking at. And if you remember, again, last week we had Jesus getting baptized by John the Baptist. Um, John the Baptist was arguing with Jesus, according to, I believe it was Matthew's account, that said like, hey, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You're, You're the one that should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, no, no. I need to be baptized to fulfill the righteousness of the law. I know I don't have sin to be washed from, essentially, is what he's saying. But I'm going to do this because I'm identifying with the sinner. This is my entire ministry 
is that yes, I am perfect. Yes, I am without sin. But like Hebrews 4.15 says, we have a high priest who can sympathize with all of our weaknesses. And see, Jesus had to endure all of the law and go through it and sustain it and maintain it. And also he had to go through the tempting of living life as just a human, remember, 100% God, but limited by his, his humanity in the sense that he now was feeling hunger pains. Did God ever feel hunger pains before he put on flesh? Like, think about the things that Jesus encountered that he wouldn't have had to if he didn't come down for us. But he says, now I get tired, <laughs> like humanity, like the perfect servant throughout the book of Mark. Jesus is like serving people and he's exhausted. You're, you're, like, he has real limitations now. But he was willing to endure that so that he can tell us, hey, I've lived it. And through the power of the word, through the power of the spirit, you are able to live it too. Amen. And so what we see here is Jesus comes off this radical, awesome baptism. If you remember last week, we talked about we saw the Trinity. We saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove right upon Jesus. So there's God, the spirit coming down from heaven. God, the son in the water. Right. God, the father up in the, in, the, in the heavens, speaking out, saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Like you have the manifestation of the Trinity happening, right? You're like, this is awesome. It's glorious. And I don't know about you guys, but I'll go on like a retreat or I'll go and do some kind of ministry event that's just fire, just an awesome thing. It's just great. And then you get back to real life and you're like, oh no, the real problems are still here. The real trials are still here. Like, I don't know if you guys can relate to that, but retreats are a big one for me. Cause I feel like, you know, you get a men's retreat, for instance, get all these guys. They're like, dude, I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to start treating my wife and my kids better. All these things. I'm going to be a better employee. And then they get down the mountain and they're like, oh no, this is where the rubber meets the road. Right. I actually, I'm going to have to do these things. And the thing comes in, it's like, man, I'll never be able to do this. But Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm going to prove to you again, relying on the word of God relying on being filled with the spirit, you can overcome all these things through him. And the good news is, is when we do not, he has. And that's the excitement, right? We don't want to preach this. This is just like a way for us to live better. That's not what it is. But we live in response to what Jesus has done for us. And so in this section, you see Jesus being, being led by the spirit. And I think that's a wild statement, right? Because I don't know about you guys, but I pray for like the Lord to fill me and lead me with the spirit because I think it's going to bring the most peace and joy in my life, right? Like, okay, if I walk according to the spirit, everything's going to be perfect, right? Jesus says, I'm being led by the spirit into where? The wilderness. Like, that's a crazy idea, right? Like, I thought the wilderness was my time when I was away from the Lord. Now I'm filled with the spirit and the spirit's leading me to a wilderness. And why is he leading us there? Because there's temptation to be had there. Testing, if you will. And it's been said that a faith that has not been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And see, we have a savior who can be trusted because he's been tested. He's been proven. And the reality is, and we all know this, when we came to the Lord and we got filled with the Holy Spirit, man, attack came like immediately, right? I hope that's everyone's account because that's, that's the reality. You enter this spiritual warfare that Ephesians 6 talks about. You have an enemy that's fighting against you, a very real enemy that wants to do away with you for the fact that you glorify God now. He hates it. And so he's out here. And the goal for, for Satan in this passage, for the devil, is to get Jesus to be disqualified from being the perfect human, perfect man to go to the cross and die in our place. That's Satan's goal at this point in the story. He says, if I can get Jesus to not go to the cross, then no one's going to get saved and God won't get any glory. That's the goal, right? That's what Satan thinks he can do. And so it says that he was tempted for 40 days and that number 40 is big in scripture, right? Think about 40 years of wandering for the Israelites, 40 days and nights of rain uh, upon the earth to cleanse the earth during Noah's the flood, right? With Noah, you have uh, here 40 days of temptation. It's usually a number of testing, trial, judgment, all these things. We know it's not judgment in Jesus' case, so it's a time of testing. And it continues on in verse two, it says, he was being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when, he had, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So the very first temptation, there's going to be three temptations in this section, right? Which I, I think most of us are pretty familiar with the section. But 
It's very interesting to me. Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call him, the devil, he has like a game plan that he's been executing for years and years and years. Think about what he did with Eve in the garden. He came to Eve and said, hey, as a serpent, says, hey, look at that fruit on that tree. Doesn't that look so good? And remember, Eve was told by Adam, who received it from God, don't eat of the forbidden tree because you'll die, right? The serpent came and said, oh, you won't die. You'll just like, it's actually really good for you if you eat it, right? And she started to listen to the enemy change the words of God and really disregard the word of God for her life, right? And she, is, she bought in in the garden and said, okay, yeah, like I can, I'll partake of this because this serpent, which I don't even know how it works. Why are you talking to a serpent, right? <laughs> That's kind of a crazy thing. Adam, where are you at to let your wife be hanging out talking to this serpent, man? Like, where are you at? Protect your wife. But she's over here having this conversation. She ends up partaking and we know that original sin entered there, right? And then she went over to Adam and convinced Adam, hey, look at nothing happened to me. I partook. They both partake and just sin enters the world. So Satan says, man, that worked last time with the first Adam. Here's this new guy that's supposed to be the new son of God, right? Because remember, Adam had no father or mother. We looked at that genealogy last week. He was called the son of God. The original son of God, but he failed. Here's the true God, the son, Jesus Christ. And when he comes out here, Satan's like, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you work a miracle to provide for yourself? And see, we look at that and go, well, what is that? Is that really that bad of a thing? But here's what it is. He would no longer be depending upon the father if he acts out and actually turns this limestone into bread. It's I'm going to take matters into my own hand and I'm not going to rely upon God. And if, if God had a plan for Jesus as the Messiah, wouldn't God sustain him through those plans? The cross is the plan for Jesus. Jesus knew this. But for Satan to come and say, dude, you're getting really hungry, huh? You might die. You better turn some rocks into bread right now. That would be saying, you know what? I don't believe God's plan for my life, that there's a cross coming anytime soon, that there's salvation coming. I better take my life into my own hands. And I just love it because he quotes him Deuteronomy. I believe it's Deuteronomy 8, 3, where he says, man doesn't live by, by, by bread alone, right? But by every word of God. And what he's quoting here, first of all, he's quoting Deuteronomy. I don't know about you guys, but so many times people are like, oh, that's Old Testament. Don't quote Old Testament at me. I'm like, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy more than any other book in scripture, which I think is really interesting. Um, it's also the second giving of the law. Like when I read through the Bible sometimes on my own, I'm like, I have to read the law again a second time, right? Jesus is like, dude, this is the book I quote the most from. Read it, right? And Jesus quotes it in his very first encounter that we get. He says, man, we live when we rely upon the word of God. Bread sustains us in the sense that we eat it, but the bread didn't save us. The maker of the bread saved us. And see, that section from Deuteronomy 8.3 was Moses reminding the people that you guys had manna come, not, and the manna didn't save you. It was God that provided the manna. You had to go out in faith and trust that that manna would come every day. So don't trust in bread. Don't think that you're so great that you could make your own bread and provide for yourself because we know if you tried to store that manna, it would go bad, right? If you tried to put your own work into the thing, the Lord said, no, you got to rely on me. I'll feed you, but it's me doing it. Does that make sense? And so there's a dependency that had to come from Jesus upon the father. If he stops depending upon the father, he's now walking in his own way. And it would be sin at that point for Jesus, who's to be the perfect man relying upon the father. So Satan's like, this is great. I'm going to get you when you're hungry. And that's, so, that's like so gnarly. I don't know about you guys, but Sunday morning at the church, <laughs> you're hungry already, right? This is 40 days <laughs> in the wilderness. And it says that he was, he was getting hungry. I think this is really interesting because Luke was a physician, right? I didn't know this until I read some commentary, but they were saying like, you can fast for a long time. And within three, day three, day four, you actually don't have hunger pains anymore. You get over hunger. But when your body starts hungering again, it means it's eating away at the body. It's going to die. You're going to starve to death when you start getting hungry again after 40 days. Luke is writing this in here like, dude, Jesus is about to die. He's so hungry, <laughs> like literally starving. And I just think it's a really interesting note. I feel like sometimes I'm dramatic about things. Like <laughs> Jesus was about to die and he has the mental wherewithal to be like, I'm going to quote the scripture. You get, get away from me. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know. Like that blows my mind. I get hangry, right? Jesus is like, if anyone should be hangry, it should be me, and I'm still obeying the Lord. And so that's the first temptation that's there. I think it reminds me of John 6, 38. It says, Jesus said this. He said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. And see, that's the heart of this temptation is, hey, stop obeying the will of your father. Do your own thing. And I guess just a quick side note on that section is how many times as a man, I go, I have to figure out my own thing. I have to put my work in. I have to do my part. And don't get me wrong. We don't want to be lazy. But there's a reality where I go, man, I have to make my own destiny. I have to go out. God has a plan. That's great. But he's not moving. So I'm going to move for him. And I think in this sense, it's like, man, just trust the promises that the Lord has given over your life. Whatever season you're in, let the Lord open those doors. Step through them when he opens them. But, man, we start forcing doors and kicking things down, right? I'm speaking from experience. Like even this week, I'm speaking from experience where there's just no peace. And I'm like, but it feels like I'm doing something, Lord, right? Lord says, you need to chill. I have a plan that I've given you. You need to trust in that plan, amen? And it's hard. And the enemy will come in and try to throw scripture at you that's incorrect. He'll try to mess with you. We're gonna see that in this next section. Look at verse five through eight, the second temptation. It says, then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only and him only you shall serve. So now you have a second attack. First one didn't work. Jesus, you know, outdid Adam and Eve. He didn't partake of things he shouldn't be eating. But now Satan says, hey, look it, I get it. You don't want to eat anything because there's this plan for you to be glorified, right? As savior and all that. Cool. I could give you that right now. You bow to me and everyone will know, man, you'll have all the glory. You'll be able to rule and reign just as you, you know, you've been told you're going to do. And you think about this, this is Satan like, hey, just bow to me. <laughs> The first one was an attack in the realm of body. This one is an attack of the realm of soul. This is like, hey, bow your soul to me and I'll give you what you want. And he actually uses this term when he, when he tells him that um, in, verse, in verse five and six, he tells him that if he worships him, that term in the original language was bowing the knee like unto a king. So the idea is, Jesus, I get that you're supposed to rule and reign. Let me, look, I have a quick route for you. Just bow to me. And I'll give you power over everything in the world. And I don't know about you, but as a man, as a person, as a human being, you're like, that sounds pretty easy, right? Versus a cross, dying on a cross. This is way easier. All I have to do is bend my knee to this, this person that's easy. This would mean that he would, again, worship someone other than God the Father. He would, it would, the plan would look very similar in the result, but it would be a completely different path and means. Does that make sense? And how many times we'll say things like, well, I just want to please God and his plan is for this. And then like, we have this other route that we can take to get there. And we're like, oh, well, this is way easier. I'm going to take that route. (laughs) This is what's being offered to Jesus here. And it's crazy because the word for devil in the original language is diabolos. And it is connected with lying. It's connected with slandering, false witness, the accuser. And I look at this section and I go, he's saying that he owns all the world, right? If I'm being honest, I think one of two things is happening here. We know that Satan was a usurper, right? Like he's come in, he's the prince of the power of the air. The world's not his, it's God's. But he says that he has power over it and he'll give it to Jesus. The guy's a liar. Either, even if he has power, do you think really he's gonna be like, all right, Jesus, here you go, pal. You surrendered to me. That's not gonna happen. And also I... I honestly firmly believe he doesn't have the authority to give that over. We know that Jesus is the one that's worthy to open the seals. Jesus is the one that's going to deliver the people. He's going to be the one that saves. Satan has no, re- no authority to actually govern the earth. There's a theory that says that Adam handed that deed over to, to Lucifer, right? I just challenge anyone, find the scripture that tells us that. But then on the other side, find all the scriptures where Lucifer's a liar, He's lying to Jesus. He's trying to convince him, listen to me and don't listen to the father. See, Satan loves to deceive us with plans that sound like, man, they're going to bring glory. And they may look like they can bring glory. He even promises, hey, this is going to be great. But we know how sin is, right? You partake in it. And you're like, man, I regret that. This was not what it was chalked up to be. This is not what I thought I was going to get out of this. 
And Satan's trying to get Jesus to walk into that trap, right? And I love it. He quotes, again, Deuteronomy 6.13 to him. It's all Deuteronomy that he's going to quote in this section. And he says, you shall serve the Lord God alone. And man, this is just the word for us today, right? In a culture where there's so many things that say, hey, this is God's plan. It is God's plan to do this thing, to be, I mean, forgive me if this sounds crazy, but to be political, to be an activist, to be these things. People take the word of God and say, this is what you're supposed to do with it. And I'm, so, I'm talking about both sides here. Let me be clear. I'm not talking about just like liberals or just conservatives. It happens everywhere. People will take the things of God and they'll twist it in a way like this is God's plan for you. We need to be careful with the way that the word of God is handled and dealt with to make sure that we're still glorifying God first and foremost because the gospel says that we are dead in sin and trespass. And the reason the gospel exists is not to make us a better person. It's to glorify God and for us to be made more like Jesus and spend eternal life with him through his grace. Amen. Anyone that's going to tell you like, hey, this is the 10 steps to live a better life because of the Bible. Like Jesus is like, dude, you're going to take up a cross daily and follow me. You're not. This isn't about you. It's not about the agenda. Think about the Jews who thought Jesus was coming to overthrow Rome. He's like, you guys have missed me completely. This is never a political agenda. This is a personal wicked heart agenda that needs to get changed into walking in righteousness. And so that's what's being given here in this sense. And I know Jesus said in Luke 16, 13, he said, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon and see mammon, that money and value and glory, earthly passing stuff. Jesus says, man, you try to serve that is going to leave you bankrupt, but you serve the Lord. And that's what you're created to do. And it rivaled everything. Even in their time, we think that we're so advanced in 2021. Like, oh man, we got Teslas and we got Bitcoin, right? We got all these things. There was always something that people wanted more than the Lord. And it always came down to like gratifying their own desires. Jesus is like, man, that's, that's going to end badly. If you think you can serve God and yourself, it's not going to happen. You got to serve the Lord, Lord, Lord alone. And so he, he, he counters Satan with that. And then look at the next section, nine through 12. It says, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over to keep you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And so the last temptation now is one I would say of spirit. We saw body, we saw soul. This one's spirit in the sense of like your drive and your desires and where you're going and what's your direction, what's your will upon your life, if that makes sense. And see, Jesus right here is being told by Satan, hey, let's come up to the pinnacle of the temple. And so I don't know what this looks like. I'll be honest with you, what exactly how this worked. But here they are, it would seem, what Satan is challenging him to do is, hey, jump off the top of the temple here in Jerusalem. And for years, I used to think that this was like almost like the devil trying to like get Jesus to like commit suicide or something, right? Like there's this element, like maybe he's like, oh, the angels will catch you, dude, just jump off, right? There's a little element of that maybe, but I got to think Jesus said of himself, I can lay up down my life, I can take it up again, right? Like, I don't know how that really works outside of the will of the Lord, maybe suicide situation. I think it's more like this. He quotes the verse about not tempting the Lord your God. The tempting the Lord is to prove himself, to make him save you in a situation that you weren't supposed to be in. I believe it's more like this. Jesus is on this, on this pinnacle of the temple. And see, the Jews at that time believed that the Messiah would show up and reveal himself by standing on the roof of the temple. And so when they would see that guy show up on the roof, this is their tradition. It's not scriptural, but they had their own beliefs of it. They said, man, when the Messiah comes, he's going to stand up here. We're going to see him and he's going to do like great miracles and things. And then we'll be able to put our faith in him because he's our savior from Rome, right? Satan knows scripture. He knows this isn't how Jesus triumphal entry plays out. We know what it's like. It's going to be in a couple of weeks, right? We celebrate Palm Sunday. You come in lowly on the back of a baby donkey, right? You come in on a certain date from a certain time given in Daniel 9, right? The certain amount of years from the time they said to rebuild. It's not the time and it's not the mode of how Jesus was to reveal himself. And see, if he jumps off the pinnacle and angels rescue him, all the people that are at the temple are like, dude, that's the Messiah. It's the wrong timing, the wrong way. 
And Satan's like, dude, you will be disqualified from fulfilling all of the prophecy about the Messiah. And you think about that, it's crazy because there's some element where you're like, again, it sounds like God's plan for Jesus' life to be revealed as Messiah, right? But that's not the way it's supposed to happen. And Satan's like, why don't you just do it? Come on, go ahead and do it. Isn't it written? And he quotes Psalm, it's uh, Psalm 91, 11 through 12. He says, it says in the word of God that you're the, you're the Messiah. Your feet won't like hit the rocks, right? The angels are going to save you. He says, isn't it written? This blows my mind because that means that Satan studied the word of God. He's quoting scripture. That's scary. <laughs> like so many times we think that the word of God belongs only to us to fight with. He'll use it in a twisted way. The same way he twisted it in the garden told Eve, has God really said that? He tells Jesus, hey, did God, didn't God say in Psalm 91 that you'll be safe if you do things like this? And Jesus is like, like no, 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 no. It says in, in Deuteronomy that you shouldn't tempt the Lord your God. He fights the word with the correct application of the word. That's huge. I think so many times we can get ourselves in situations because someone comes with a word from God, like, hey, you need to do this. You can do that. And it's completely out of context. Like, God forbid, I study, uh, honestly, I hope this is clear. I study my face off before I open the word of God to teach anybody because I'm like, man, I don't want the judgment of misquoting the word of God, misapplying the word of God, disregarding the original context of who it was written to and why. So I can try to convince someone that they can live like nicely. Like that's what this is for. If that was the case, Jesus could have bowed his knee to Satan and been received glory immediately. If that was the case, he could have just jumped off the pinnacle and been like, forget the word of God. I'm going to do this the way I want to do it. <laughs> But that's not at all how this was supposed to work. He was supposed to come in at the proper time, according to Zechariah 9, 9, and 10. He was supposed to come on, on the back of a donkey, like Zechariah 9 said, and in the correct time, like <laughs> Daniel 9 says. Does that make sense? So what we're talking about here is a temptation to buy in a misuse of the word of God. But Jesus fights the devil, being filled with the spirit and filled with the word of God. I was counseling a young man this week. We were talking about um, just the power of the word and how important it is to be in it. And he said, man, it blows my mind how like knowing the word seems to like help me overcome. And I know these are really basic things, but he was a younger dude and he's like new to the faith. And he's like studying the word actually like feeds my, my, my spirit in a way to where I'm not doing the things I used to be doing. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of, that's how, that's what it's designed for, man. Like that's because you now, as you read it, faith comes, right? Faith comes right here and hearing by the word of God. And as you read it, you start to realize that the Lord loves you. He cares for you. And as you honor his word, it is the best thing for you. And when you start experiencing it and walking in it, it's, it's, it's like addictive. You want to stay in the word and grow and grow in it. And we were saying, man, it's crazy that Jesus could have quoted anything he wanted. He could have made up new verses because he's the, he is the word, right? He's the logos. He is God. He could do, he could say anything he wanted. He probably could have like evaporated Satan on the spot, but he came to identify with sinners and to say, look at, this is how you're going to be able to survive this. Be filled with the spirit and quote the word of God accurately. Trust the word accurately, like know it for reals. And that spoke to me so much that it's like, man, if Jesus relied on the very things that we have in our hand, right? Like this is possible for us. I'm not saying we're Jesus. Let me be clear on that by no means, but we have the same weapons and tools that Jesus had. And oh, man, we, we should take that pretty seriously. I think, right? I mean, that's where I'm at. And it was like really eye-opening just to think about, man, so many times I think I have to achieve, like oh, I'm not, I'll never have the skill set <laughs> of Jesus. Well, yeah, to some extent as God, but as man, he relied upon the things that we have access to as well. And I think it's crazy because Satan, even with Jesus is like, oh, I'm going to come back again. I'm going to come and get you at an opportune time. It says in verse 13. And if that's not, if that's not the enemy, I don't know what it is, right? He's like, oh, you think you won this time? I'm going to come and get you very soon. I'm going to continue to attack when it makes sense. And so for me, I think there's times when I'm like, yes, I did it. I defeated Satan at 503 today, 504. <laughs> Here's Satan again. He's like, what about this thing? You're like, oh man, I thought we were over this game, right? And praise the Lord. My, my hope is not in my defending myself against Satan. My hope is in the fact that Jesus has forgiven my sin and that Jesus will someday defeat Satan, amen? We see that in Revelation. It's one sentence. I love it. Satan's just like, you're done. You're gone. <laughs> just done. And I think, man, do that now, Lord, right? But in his timing, in his timing, in his way. And so we see all of the, the testing. And then verse 14 and 15, we see that he begins teaching. It says, then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee. 
And news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he's still filled with the spirit. But I think this is cool. So he uses the spirit for the, the attacks, right? So he relies upon the word and the spirit for attacking. He also relies upon the word and the spirit for ministering. So for the good things in the Lord and the, the, the attack that happens when you're in the Lord, the common denominator is the word and the spirit. So if you're on a mountaintop experience, you're like, oh, cool, I'm doing great. I don't need the word right now. Incorrect. Jesus relied upon the word even when he taught and he relied upon the spirit to minister. When you're in a valley, you're like, oh, I can't get through this. Incorrect. Jesus was able to do it through the power of the spirit and through the word. Amen. Amen. And so this just shows that he's beginning this. He's in the region of Galilee. It was a, an area with like three million people in it. and It was smaller than Connecticut. So that's pretty dense. There was a lot of people in this area. So there's a lot of people for Jesus to go and teach. And so what he would do is he'd go to the synagogues. He'd go in um, to the basically the, that's the Jewish church, right? He was a Jew. He came to the Jews first and he would go and he would tell them, hey, I'm the kingdom of God is at hand. The same thing that, that John the Baptist, the forerunner preached. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus would come and say, the kingdom's here. And we're going to see in this next section, he'd teach them that, hey, I'm the fulfillment of all those things. You have to put your faith in me. And so this is what Jesus taught. We're going to see it here. Um, it says that they were that he was glorified. So this is kind of interesting because. I don't know about you guys, but I always think that Jesus constantly had people fighting him when he'd teach. Like you'd think that people were constantly like chastising him, giving him an issue. When he first started, people were all right with Jesus's message. I think that's big. Like when you first bring the message to someone, they're kind of cool with it on like a surfacey level. They're like, all right, that sounds cool. Like that sounds good. You're like, by the way, you're a sinner and you need to be saved. You're like, I'm offended now. Get out of here and I hate you. Right? Like that's that's the model and the pace of Jesus' ministry. It starts as like, hey, this sounds like good news to us. But then when the call to action happens, when the inclusion of Gentiles and grace is in there, the Jews in their pride are like, never mind, we don't want any part of this. And that's what we're going to see here. Look at verse 16. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> this is like insane. I know we, it's like you read it now. If you, you read this first, first glance, you're like, okay, so Jesus is talking about the word. And we know Jesus is Lord and Savior. But you have to remember now he's in his hometown in Nazareth, right? Remember, he was born in Bethlehem, but from Nazareth, born, like raised in, in Nazareth. He walks into the, into the temple there, into, or into the, the synagogue. And it says what he did is he, he, it was his turn to read essentially that day. Like you had your grown men. Remember he's 30 years old at this time. Um, they would basically take turns reading scripture. It's Jesus's turn this week in his hometown. He walks over, they hand him the scroll. It's Isaiah. What is this? Isaiah 61 verses one and two. He opens the scroll up and reads this section that everyone knows is a messianic passage. If you're a Jew, you've gone through like what we would call maybe like our catechism or whatever we want to call it. They've gone through it. They've learned the scriptures, right? As children, they were raising it. They put them, the scriptures in little boxes on their wrist and on their forehead. They knew this scripture. Jesus gets this scripture, which I think is great timing, right? Like that's good. Like, I mean, he could make any part of the Bible be him right but i think it's so fitting he walks in they hand him they're like this week's reading jesus is isaiah 61 he's like no all right let's read that and so he opens it up he reads and those are the verses that we have here 18 through 19 right so it's isaiah 61 verse 1 and 2a he doesn't complete all of verse 2 we'll get on that but he basically reads this and it says again i'll read it just so we have the context the spirit of the lord is upon me which we know jesus already had the spirit upon him because he had anointed me, that came from heaven in the form of the dove, to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. You start reading these things and you see that he's to bring the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to bring liberty to captives and heal the blind and liberty to the oppressed. And when you read those, you know that Jesus did some of these things physically, right? He healed blind people. We know that in scripture. Um, he, he preached the gospel to the poor. He himself was poor. He's in Nazareth now, right? And Nazareth wasn't the best part of town. Remember, people are like, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Golly, that's a bad area, right? So he's preaching the gospel to the poor. He's fulfilling some of these things on a, on a physical level. But we know that he didn't free the oppressed, right? He didn't bring liberty to the Jews under Rome. But see, the people hearing the words were like, this is cool. This is the section we like because it's the part where we get our way. The government that's over us, that's holding us down, oppressing us, they're going to get overthrown when the Messiah shows up. And remember, there's, there's rumors, there's stirrings about Jesus doing really crazy things already. He's turned water to wine already. We don't get that in Luke, but we get it in John. He's already had this crazy baptism where people were like, this is a weird experience. Like no one else had this when they got dipped in the water. There's a voice from heaven. There's a dove. Many people write about it. Peter, Luke, Matthew, Mark, they all wrote about that occurrence. So many people saw it. And so people, you can imagine they're like expecting him to read this and be like, I'm here to overthrow Rome today. But when he, he, he closed this thing up, see, he didn't go out and go, all right, let's get our swords and go fight Rome now. The idea was, hey, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. And what that comes from is Leviticus 25, the Jubilee year. Every 49 years of the 50th year, so seven sets of seven, after that was done, the 50th year, all debts were forgiven. All slaves were set free. Jubilee, it was a glorious, wonderful time. Jesus is saying today, because I am here, man, the oppressed are going to get set free because it's the year of Jubilee. And we know if Jesus was talking about physical release of the captives, Jesus failed. That sounds like a crazy thing to say, by the way, Jesus failed. That's a weird thing to say as a pastor. But we're talking about context. People today will quote this section and say, Jesus came to like, help the oppressed physically. Don't get me wrong. Jesus did some awesome things physically, but Jesus was never talking about a physical release. He was talking about sin. He was talking about the wages of sin that leads to eternal death. It doesn't mean that we don't go help the oppressed and the poor. Let me be clear. But to think that Jesus was out here trying to just save people from like an agenda and a politician or like political party is incorrect. He came to save people from their sins. And we see this as he tells them, he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You're like, no, it's not. You didn't free Rome. It will free us from Rome yet. But what he's saying is I'm here because I'm the one that's going to free you from your sin. I'm here and the, the kingdom starts today. And the reason he doesn't complete all of Isaiah 61 verse two is because the B part of verse two is talking about the judgment that's going to come from the Messiah. And see, Jesus didn't read that part. He closed it because he says, I'm not here for judgment yet. I'm not here to deliver my people from the powers of this world. That's coming. And I guarantee you, Jesus is coming again. Amen. He came the first time perfectly fulfilled. He didn't jump off a pinnacle of a temple because he fulfilled the word perfectly by coming on the back of a donkey. And he did that. I believe it was April 6, 32 AD. But there's, there's a theory that says we can find the date that Jesus fulfilled the first part. He's going to fulfill the later part. But the reality is he says, I'm here and this is being fulfilled because I've shown up. And so you got to think of the people in the synagogue. They're like, Jesus, we've watched you grow up since you were a boy. You're that weird kid that everyone didn't know who your father actually was. How dare you say you're the Messiah, right? Like, we don't even know who your dad is. Like, guys on the outside that didn't believe that God was his father. Like, there's a very weird thing here. We had a young betrothed virgin walk around pregnant. I don't know. Like, Jesus, are you crazy, right? And so he's, he says it's fulfilled, and they hear his words, Look at what it says in verse 22. It says, so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? So they heard the words and they're like, man, this sounds really good. And it sounds smarter than anything a carpenter's son could say. But this is Joseph's son, man. I'm not buying this. My logic says there's no way that you can be the deliverer that you say you are. My eyes, my physical eyes are seeing a man that I can't put my faith in. And see that that physical realm is keeping them from that heavenly blessing. And I don't know about you guys, but that's, 
I feel like that's the battle, right? Is when I'm witnessing and preaching to people, they're like, that sounds cool, but I don't think I believe it. It doesn't make enough sense scientifically. It doesn't make sense for me right here. Why do I need a savior? And it's like, well, that's the very thing that keeps you from experiencing the savior. We've talked about how if you diligently seek the Lord, he's a rewarder of faith, right? I think it's Hebrews eleven six 6 that talks about that. And man, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you trust in him, man, he, he'll start to show who he is. But see what's happening here. Look at, they say, this, isn't this Joseph's son? Like this, it can't be real, right? And look at what Jesus' response is in verse 23. He says, he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who is a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, listen, this has happened before. Jesus himself is a prophet. We understand that. He says, I'm a prophet coming in to the people of Israel, my own very people, and you don't want to believe in me. He says, this is kind of what happened before with Elijah and Elisha. They showed up to Israel to call Israel to repentance while they were serving Baal and all these foreign gods, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't have it. The kings rejected the prophets, and what did the prophets end up doing? They went out to Gentiles. They went out to these other regions. And he quotes that Elijah went and found a widow of Zarephath in Sidon. Like, this is insane. Like, in their culture, a woman was much less valuable than a man. A widow was nearly useless. And a Gentile widow? Like, that was insane in that culture. You're like, they're of no purpose. Jesus is saying, Elijah went to a widow because they were willing to receive his word of God in faith while Israel disbelieved. Does that make sense? And see what Jesus is saying. He's like, I'm calling an example because this is what's happening right now. I'm right here. You guys are at church in a synagogue wanting the Messiah and the Messiah's in your presence, but you refuse to believe because it doesn't line up with your agenda because it doesn't line up with your model, with your program. He says, and then there was Elisha, the prophet who went out and Naaman was a centurion of Syria. He's the enemy. And he had, he, if you remember, it's in second Kings five, I believe. Naaman was covered in leprosy and he tried everything. He tried all of the essential oils, right? No, I don't know. He tried all the different things that would maybe heal leprosy. He tried the juice cleanse. He tried it all. And his servant girl basically says, hey, there's this guy, Elisha, who supposedly has the power of God, like the God of Israel upon him. You should go see him. And Naaman's like, that makes no sense scientifically. It makes no sense practically. And she's like, what else do you have right now? Why don't you go try it? And Naaman, in his great glory and power as a, as a commander of the same army, sucks it up and goes over and meets with Elisha and is like, hey, I humbly come to you and tell you, I don't know what's happening here, but I need to get cleansed. And remember, Elisha tells him, hey, you have to dip in the river seven times. <laughs> Number of completion, but Naaman's a foreign Syrian. He's like, what are you talking about? Dip in the water. He's like, just do it. If you believe in God, you obey his commands as, as sometimes foreign as they may sound. And it's like, okay, I'll go do this. And on that seventh dip, remember, he's completely washed clean. He comes out and he's completely cleansed. And Jesus is saying, do you guys not remember this in scripture? I know you read these scriptures. Naaman, the widow, they were not Jews, but they received the blessing of God because they put their faith in the things that seemed unreasonable. See, the widow was told, you only have a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour. But if you bake a cake for me, Elijah said, it'll show that you're trusting God and he'll provide to where you never run out. And she did it. She said, that makes no sense. I feel like I should feed myself and my son first. But okay, I'm going to die anyways. What do I have to lose? And she does it and the Lord provides for her. How many times have people said, hey, I'm going to die either way. Why not try this Jesus thing? <laughs> and when they tried it, they said, oh my gosh, this is totally, completely true. This is completely real and sincere. And I don't know if that's your story. I feel like there's sometimes you just get your spot in a situation where you're so desperate. You're like, I'll, I'll try anything to get out of this. I, you know, I'll, I'll, whatever it happens to be Jesus, let's give it a shot. <laughs> and you open up the word and you're like, oh no, this is hitting differently. <laughs> this is real. 
And so Jesus is saying, look at you guys are acting just like the unbelieving apostate Israel. And if you do that, the Messiah, me, I'm going to go out somewhere else. And look at their response in verse 28. It says, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. So I don't know. This is funny. I was reading this. I was thinking about like the cancel culture thing that's happening right now. Like if I don't like it, we get rid of it, right? Here's Jesus. And he says, here's the deal. You guys aren't listening. And if you, if you put your faith in me, I will deliver you. I will heal the broken hearts. I will he- lead you out of oppression. And they're like, we don't like the way you're saying it. What we're going to do is silence your voice. We're going to stone you right now. That's cancel culture all the way, by the way. And what's interesting about this, and it happens on all sides, I think, but the reality is you can try to silence truth, but it doesn't change the truth that lies therein. You're only harming yourself when you refuse to obey truths. And so they throw, they, they, they plan to throw Jesus off the edge of the hill. That's the first step in stoning someone. I don't know if we know this, but it's not that they thought he'd fall and die off this throat. They push him over and then they're going to pummel him with stones. And it's interesting because Jesus could have called those angels like in Psalm 91, right? Because he is doing the things of the Lord. He does have the protection. He could call those angels, that legion that he has ready, that he told his, his disciples in the garden that are always there to take care of him. He could have relied on that. I love how Jesus just simply walks through the midst of them. He just shows them like, yeah, listen, I don't die here. <laughs> this is not where I'm going to die. You can't kill me here. I'm going to a cross. And I'm going to complete salvation. You can try to tell me you're going to beat me and do all these things. I'm just going to walk through the midst of you and I'm going to go on my way. You can choose to follow me or you can choose to try to beat me. You won't beat me, but I'm going my way either way. I think that's so big. Like the fact that Jesus goes, I'm, 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 going, I'm going where I was planning to head. You can either come with me or stay here mad. And unfortunately, the people that were there at that moment, it just says that they, they, were, they were just filled with wrath and rage. They didn't receive Jesus when he came in with the good news that he would heal their broken hearts. But the reality was they didn't believe they had broken hearts. They believed that the problem was wrong. It wasn't their problem. It wasn't them that was the issue. They didn't need fixing, they thought. And it's just a wild thing because it's funny. Jesus said, you guys in your heart, you're saying you want me to perform miracles like I performed and then you'll believe. I'm not going to do that. But see, they were entitled because they, they felt like, oh, we're your home people. You need to show us who you are. You got to prove it. We don't want just your word. If you give us a sign, then we'll believe your word. This is kind of miraculous the way Jesus walks out of the room, right? How does a mob of people not kill him or touch him? I think at that point, you got to go, hey, maybe this guy is the Messiah. Like, why are we not stoning him right now? Let's follow him. But pride and sin is just blinding, right? And so I look at this section and I go, man, we see that Jesus was tempted by the spirit. We also see that he taught in the power of the spirit and his, his word goes out. If you put your faith in the word of the Lord, man, you're going to be saved. But if you reject Jesus, man, he's going to continue going his way and you're just going to be left with wrath. Put your trust in Jesus. Amen. And so I'm going to be honest with you. How are we doing? We good? We got like 10 verses left. We'll, we'll slam through it. If you guys are good with it. What do you think? All right. Hey, that's your own funeral. All right, here we go. Verse 31, it says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and it did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is for with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in their surrounding region. So Jesus leaves the one synagogue saying, I'm not going to give you a sign just because you're my homegrown hometown people. I'm not doing that. You can believe my word. Okay. Goes into another region into Capernaum, which is interesting because he said that one day these guys would ask for the signs that he would do at Capernaum. He goes on to Capernaum and starts teaching. 
His intention was not to do a miracle to prove himself. His intention was to teach the word. But while he's teaching, and I think it's interesting. I don't, I don't see any single ladies in here, so this is good. I just, online, if there's single ladies, don't think just because a guy goes to church, he's holy. This dude has a demon in him, and he's hanging out at church, right? I think that's kind of interesting. He's, like, screaming out. Like, it's just a dramatic thing, right? Like, oh, he's so good. He goes to church. He has a demon in him, and he's screaming, like, oh, you're here to destroy us. You're, and that's a crazy thing. It's more than one demon in this guy. You're here to destroy us. Like, this is this, the holy one of God. Just imagine Jesus is teaching the same thing he's been teaching, which is the kingdom of God is here. I'm the kingdom, right? Like I'm the fulfillment of the Messiah. This demon's like screaming out. And I don't know, maybe this demon was in this dude for a long time and no one ever preached anything with power. So it just laid there dormant. Jesus comes in, preaches the kingdom. And this thing's like, oh my gosh, you're going to destroy us because you're the holy one of God. And he just rebukes it, right? Jesus' word is be quiet, come out of him. And the guy stops yelling. So he's quiet with it. One shriek, the thing comes out and he's not hurt at all. It says that he was there, not beat up by the demon. I don't know about you guys, but like Acts, I think it's Acts 19, maybe or 17 sons of Sceva where they're like, Hey, we'll go out in the name of Jesus. Who is Paul's God. Right. And we can cast out demons. They get their butts whooped. They get their clothes taken from them. They get beat up so bad. They leave naked. Right. Like it's bad news encountering a demon. Jesus says, shut your mouth and get out of that guy. And not only did he deliver the demon, but the demon wasn't able to harm the man after that point. He was clean and healthy. And like, it's a wild thing because you would expect an experience like that, the man to be torn up from this situation. And Jesus says, look, I'm coming with such great power that I may look like a man, but no man has the power to do this to a demon. I am God. I'm here. And that thing recognized was God. But here's the deal. Jesus said, hey, be quiet and get out. And Jesus does this a lot because he's like, hey, I don't need demons rep, rep, like repping for me, right? I want people to rep for me. I want people that saw me do great things rep for me. Demons are a bunch of evil, whack, fallen angels. I don't need them talking about me. I want people that have been delivered from demons to talk about me. See, it wouldn't help his reputation. People are like, oh, we know that later that some people said Jesus cast out demons to the power of Satan. So it's like, I don't want people thinking that I'm on their side. I'm going to get them right out of here. But you got to think this guy that got delivered from this demon, he lived in a way where I'm sure he told everyone about what happened to him with the, with the word of Jesus. Amen. And so you see this happening here and the people are like, dude, what kind of power is this? This is insane. And it's so cool because they didn't expect a miracle like this. They came to church that day and Jesus came in. They were listening to his words and they were amazed by his words. They were astounded by his teaching. But when he cast out the demon, they're like, dude, his, he's authenticating the message that he's preaching. And see, this is us. We read the word of God and we believe it in faith. But then the word, the Lord works and does the very thing his word promised. And we're like, dude, it's true. <laughs> the Lord's real. Same thing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith doesn't come by seeing miracles because when we see a miracle, we just chalk it up to a, like a scientific anomaly, right? But when we know the word of God and then a miracle happens, we're like, no, 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 it's not a scientific anomaly. This is the Lord. He's doing what his word promised. And so then he goes home and I love it. Look at 38. It says, um, now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife, wife's mother, so this is Simon Peter, his mother-in-law, was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served him. So <laughs> Jesus leaves this, this synagogue. He teaches the word of God. He casts out a demon. Then I guess he's crashing at Peter's house, right? So Peter's his boy. We know Peter, James, John, Je uh, Jesus' tightest friends, right? So he goes over to Peter's house and Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And so they basically, I, imagine, I have to imagine they're probably like, Jesus, we know that you can cast out demons. Like my, my mother-in-law, she's going to die right now, right? And this is funny. I think some people are like, hey, man, Peter, <laughs> you, must, you must have a good mother-in-law, dude. You're trying to get her to live. That's good. I have a good mother-in-law, so I, she's online. She's, listen, very good. I would pray this thing as well. But some people are like, dude, that's, that's wild. But Peter comes over. Maybe his wife told him, hey, go ask for Jesus' healing upon my mom. I don't know, whatever this looks like. And he goes and says, Jesus, she's really sick. And remember, Luke being a physician, the original language, he describes his fever as a high, fiery fever. Like he's a physician. He's saying this is a real thing. It's not a spiritual issue in the sense she's not 
possessed by a demon, as some people may think their mother-in-laws are. That's not the case because he rebukes it, right? He rebukes it. And some people have made this like, oh, well, he rebuked a demon over here a minute ago. So now he's rebuking a demon at her. This is a, this is sickness. Jesus is showing his power over spiritual things in the first little section we saw. Now he's showing his power as the great physician, as the author of life. He says, you put your faith in me, I'll heal you. He came to heal the brokenhearted, but he's like, yeah, I'm going to heal people physically when they put their faith in me. Not always, as the Lord wills. I hope we're clear on that because there's other times Lazarus died, right? And Lazarus was resurrected, but he also died again. So there's times where Jesus says, that's not my will. But here, the will of the Father was, hey, to heal this lady. And it's so cool. Jesus rebukes the spirit of the, the, the temperature, whatever, there's a fever. She gets up and not only is she better, but she has total, complete, full strength to, to actually serve Jesus and to serve everyone else. And this to me, this is what it is coming to Jesus. I was sick. The Lord healed me. And my response is, man, I'm going to, I'm going to serve you, Jesus. and I'm going to serve everyone I can. I'm going to respond to what you've done to me and through me. And what a blessing that is, right? For all of us that have given our life to the Lord, we know what we are healed from. We know the demons that we battled. We know the sicknesses that was in, that were in us that still rear their ugly head at times. But when we trust in the Lord, we go, man, it's just my response should be serve Jesus and serve others. Amen. Amen. And so look at the last section, verse 40. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, speaking of Jesus, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the son of God. And he rebuking them did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now, when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose, I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. And so it's really, it's all one day, that last part, right? So he went to the synagogue in the morning. <laughs> he taught the word, and this is on a Sabbath. Cast out a demon that's shouting at him in the synagogue. Goes on to his boy's house, Peter's. Peter's like, hey, dude, my wife's telling me, like, my, 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 my mother-in-law's really sick. Can you heal her? She's like, healed. She gets up, starts serving him. I guess between the morning at the synagogue that everyone saw the power of Jesus, probably some people like, dude, I just heard that Jesus just cast a, a, a fever out of a lady. All this stuff's happening when the sun is setting, it says, because it's a Sabbath. They weren't allowed to journey more than three quarters of a mile. They weren't supposed to carry more than like a couple prunes or figs or whatever, right? So when the sun sets, they're like, dude, we can walk over to where Jesus is now and we can carry our sick to him. We're going to go get Jesus because he's doing amazing things. This guy that showed up and is preaching a powerful word is backing it up with great action. And it says that tons of people came and he's laying hands on every one of them, right? On every one of them, he healed them. I think this is incredible. Jesus, the servant, man, he came and he, he's not thinking about himself. He's like, I'm tired. I've cast out demons. I fixed this lady that had a fever and it's, it's nighttime now. The sun's going down. I want to chill. All these people show up. They're like, hey, Jesus, we're seeking you out because we believe that you can heal us. Jesus is never going to turn away someone that diligently come and says, I need you to heal me. He lays hands on every single one of them. And I love it because it says in the next morning after he did all that, I mean, he's casting out demons. He's doing the whole bit. The next morning, it says he had, he had gone into a deserted place. I believe it's Mark 135 that tells us that Jesus was off actually praying. And so he was praying and seeking the Lord. He's by himself. He's trying to, to get, I think, realign with the father, right? Get refreshed. And all these people start showing up. And they're like, Jesus, we're here again. We want you to do more miracles. <laughs> we want you to do things. And essentially what he says to them in verse 43, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose, I have been sent. And see, there's this reality where when we encounter Jesus Christ, we don't want him to go anywhere. We want him in our midst. We want to be with him. Juxtapose that with the group that was in Nazareth. It's like, Jesus, we don't want you. We're going to kill you. And they're just left in wrath. This group is like, we witnessed the power of Jesus. We don't want you going anywhere. We want to be with you all the time. And it reminds me of the verse where Jesus tells his disciples, hey, it's best for me to leave you so that the helper can come, the Holy Spirit can come, because then I can be everywhere. But in this verse, Jesus is like, I'm limited by this body. <laughs> I can only be one place at a time. 
Praise the, praise the Lord. Praise me. I don't know if he said that, but praise the Lord that you guys have come to me, Jesus would say. But I still have so many other people I have to go reach. And I love it because his ministry was not to perform miracles. He says, I've been sent to preach. I think we read the, the, the Gospels. And this is kind of my closing thought on this. We read the Gospels and we think that Jesus was just constantly walking around doing these things of like miracles. But this is three years that are, that's in here, right? Three years in the Gospels. It wasn't like he was casting out demons every day. He was teaching the word of God every day, though. And see, when you teach the word of God, you're going to encounter spiritual attack. And you are going to have times where I'm telling you, I've had extreme things happen in ministry. In the five years I was on staff at Pomona Valley, I can name like three things that were like, dude, that's the kind of thing you'd put like in the Bible. We witnessed some wild stuff. But by no means was that every day. The everyday thing was just continuing in the word of God being sanctified, being trusting in the, in the word that Jesus has already proclaimed. There's days where no demons are cast out. There's days where no temperatures and fevers are healed of people. But every day should be a day where we're preaching the word of God. Because at some point, that word is going to come to fruition. And man, you're going to see demons get cast out. Physically or just spiritually, mentally, emotionally, whatever we want to call it, you're going to see the Lord work when you continue in the word of God. Amen? And see, Jesus himself says think about it I'm, I'm god the son what am i here to do just teach the word you guys you can do the very same thing read the word let it just fill you with his, with his spirit and then go out and actually live upon it walk upon it and man we will be made more like jesus every day amen yes. all right let's pray lord heavenly father we come before you now and we just thank you for your goodness lord we thank you for your mercy and for your grace lord Father, we pray that we would be able to, to believe in you, even in the seasons where it doesn't seem like you're doing big, mighty, insane things in our lives, Lord, but that we would just stay in your word, Lord, knowing that at some point, Lord, it is going to come to fruition, Lord. Your promises will be made true. Your promises will come to fulfillment, Lord. And so, Father, we just come here and we, we gather to say, Lord, yes and amen. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with everything that we have, Lord, because of the work of the cross of Jesus. Lord, thank you for your blood. Lord Jesus, you died in our place. Our, our righteousness is as filthy rags, but Lord Jesus, your righteousness has been placed upon us when we willingly accept you as our Lord and Savior. And so right now, if there's anyone that, that uh, online in this room, whatever, that doesn't know the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray that right now you would realize your need for him, that you wouldn't reject him, that you wouldn't in wrath say, get away from me with that, that, that nonsense, but that you would embrace him as the people Capernaum did. They saw Jesus move mightily when they put their faith in his words. And so right now, if, you're, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you would just say this prayer right after me. You'd say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins. Give me a brand new heart. Fill me with your spirit. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, hey, thank you guys for being here this morning. Such a blessing to be able to study the word with you. We'll be looking at Luke 5 next week, 10 a.m. We'll, uh, we'll be in it. And anyone online, if you said that prayer with me and said that prayer with us, please uh, comment, direct message, reach out. We'd love to talk more about that with you. Uh, the reality is, is saying a prayer is the beginning of it, but walking in the word, walking in truth, trusting in Jesus, that's where it becomes uh, being in a disciple of Jesus Christ. So thank you for being online. We hope that it was a blessing for you. We'll see you guys next week at 10 a.m.